We're still here in Ormond Beach, Florida with a Mohawk elder, uh, Alan Hooper, and I've renamed him Newhart. And we were talking about the LVAD, or the left artificial heart, that he was given by Johns Hopkins uh, Hospital. All right, here's the device, the device that was in my stomach. We talked about that briefly. Uh, it's a five-pound titanium pump, and it actually was placed like that in the lines one line goes in the heart and the other line is you know, goes through it sits in my stomach right there and the the lines go up and then back out and then this line right here used to come out a hole that was in my stomach that's uh right there so that that was in there keeping me alive and it sounds like a model t when it runs it makes a clicking noise it's kind of loud and annoying and this was the pacemaker that's the divider and trickler pacemaker that I was talking about that was sitting up here which after later in the story when the, all this is removed it's all the devices went with it so after a year of you know rehabilitating with the mechanical heart they were able to replace it with a new used heart from a do, uh, organ donor and um, from then, this everything got smoother. They got rid of all the uh, mechanical pieces, which I was luckily able to keep. Which I don't have the pacemaker with me now, but it looks almost identical to this. It just doesn't have quite as many wires on it. Um, Let me interrupt you for just a second uh, because I saw things from a different point of view. When you were deteriorating down to the point where you're just absolutely a skeleton with some skin stretched over you. There was no meat or muscle left on your body. And they took you in to put this mechanical heart in. All of a sudden, you got circulation. You took off like a shot. You were riding motorcycles, scooters. We were going places, traveling. I mean, you turned into Arnold Schwarzenegger with a metal heart. And I think the funny story... One of the funny stories of it is when you get on the elevator in Johns Hopkins. Oh yes, yes. Like I said, it did. It da did sound like a Model T running with a clicking sound, and I had a, you know, I had a backpack. You can't really hear it that good now. I had a backpack, and you have to, if you do reverse timing, this is back in the 9/11 days when everybody is scared of bombs. I'm in Baltimore, Maryland, Johns Hopkins Medical Center going for a checkup and I show up in an elevator with the what appeared to be a ticking time bomb strapped to me and um, people would really like rush out of elevators or push people out of the way to escape the, the wrath of my uh, bomb my, so I, I was a constant bomb threat or scare anyway B constant bomb scare so but the funniest moment was in an elevator. We were trapped with an entire elevator full of people, and the lady really did scream and run and push to get out of the elevator. And one nurse asked you if you could turn that annoying noise oh, off. Oh, yes, yes. I had nurses actually ask. People asked me if I could turn it off. Can you turn that noise off? It's, it's irritating. Annoying. Yeah, it's irritating. Yeah. And in the movie theater, I actually t I, I go to the movies, and I actually... The the uh, the outtake the, it has a vent that g hooked to here, and it, this line was longer and ran out of my stomach like I discussed, and it had an air filter on the end of it, and I actually took a rubber hose and extended the the air filter a couple feet and stuck it down on the floor with the air filter on it so you couldn't hear the wo the, the whooshing sound that it made. So I could hear the movies in the theater, and everybody else wasn't staring at me the whole time. Kind of some adapted things I had to adapt to to make it so I could, you know, survive the day to day. But other than that, and and they wouldn't let me go to uh, a lot of places. Are like, oh, you can't leave your, you know, a store. Like, you're not allowed to have a backpack, and <laughs> just simply had to show them. It was kind of critical that I had a backpack and. It had all my life-saving stuff in it. <laughs> and this was the only pump in the world that actually had a backup plan. Yeah, yeah. You, you had a pump that you could pump yourself. You literally could be your own heart. Yeah, they and had a much quieter option, but the, 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 it wasn't really an option for the fact that you had no backup. 
if the battery goes dead, so do you. Yeah. There's no... So, yeah. Or if the pump quit. And the pumps only had a life expectancy at that time. I'm not sure what they have now. But then they said that they, they were only good for about a year. And so I, you know, I guess they said, maybe they said it was a couple years, but they've never seen one last more than about a year is when they start having catastrophic failure. So... It could have quit at any time. It just luckily mine held out and did its job <laughs> till I got the heart, went to transplant. So, and I, I was a lucky one because I know friends of mine that did, you know, that I made friends with that di didn't do as well as I did. So, I, I have been a blessed man for sure. <laughs> any questions? Yeah, the question is, where the heck would you find a heart that matches you? Well, I that's that in itself is I guess uh, a I don't know fate. I'm not sure. Just Almost being, a miracle. Being a blessed man, I guess, is the only thing I can say there. Um, the my donor, uh, it, some very strange things happen in that. First of all, I, I got the mechanical heart, uh, and which temporarily took me off the transplant list, and I had taken myself as well off the transplant list for a like I said before I didn't I never did any drugs I never done alcohol and things like that so I didn't even take Tylenol for pain uh, before I had gotten sick so when they came to me and they said you know you have to start taking these medications and I'm telling doctor's orders um, a couple things had happened they had given me a medication for sleeping uh, and they had gave me an amiodarone for, and I forget what was the amiodarone was for, but it wound up attacking my thyroid, which made it so uh, it was a, uh, my thyroid became amiodarone toxosis, or something that was, in, in, anyway, it ruined my thyroid, or ma made my thyroid way off. And the doctors said to me that, um, you know, I, I had to go to the endocrino endocrinologist, and the doctor said that you had to square up the thyroid, or they had to remove the thyroid before they could put me on the transplant list. And my endocrinologist told me that if I had corrected, my th thyroid could correct itself. So, with, with medication changes. So they changed the medication, and my thyroid was moving in the correct direction, and I uh, removed myself from the transplant list because I wanted to make sure, I didn't want them to, to they weren't going to do a transplant until I cut out my thyroid. So, um, that being said, I opted out of the, uh, off the list for a spell until it got corrected, which took about three months, and they did the testing, and the, that was the, that was the time that they, the, the limit they gave me. They said, we'll give you three months to let it correct, if it corrects itself, then you can, you know, we'll put you back on the, you know, you'll put you back on the list, or, you know, we can go ahead and, and do, you know, have you back on the transplant list, or you're going to have to have it removed. We'll have to do the surgery so we can put you on the list. And so when I went through that, um, they went through the three months, and I actually met the criteria, but they still removed it anyway. Kind <laughs> of. They said that at the end of the day, they, they told me afterward, they said, they said, well, we're going to take you down for the surgery, and we're going to test it one more time, and if it's okay, then you can, you know... You, you won't have to have it removed. So they took, tested it. It was okay, but the, the, the doctors universally agreed that they think it was better off to take it out anyway. So that kind of made me a little angry at the time. Um, but it, now, at the end of the day, we'll find out they have to take medication to stay alive anyway. It's just another bump in the road. Not a, that big of a deal. But um, the, the donor, back to my donor, uh, he was a Romanian... Uh, he was uh, from Romania. His dad was uh, uh, an actor or an entertainer, death mute entertainer in Romania who defected and moved over to the United States, naturalized, and uh, brought his son over at three years old. And his son was also death and mute. And they, um, they were a very tight family. The father and son were very tight. Uh, and he had gone to Bayview Medical, uh, sc the school Bayview Medical, uh, for his education. And a year prior to his death, he had gone to Florida to uh, Death and Mute School here in St. Augustine. 
Um, and he discovered that he loved Florida, and this is where he ultimately wanted to be, which is where, I, ironically, I am now. Um, he ultimately wanted to be, and uh, he had come home from the Florida to go back to school at Bayview, and he had told his dad that he wanted to be an organ donor. Um, I'm going to interrupt you there for a second, change batteries.